Hello and welcome back to the Ultra Nationalists Picnic. Today I'd like to take a look at a little blast from the past, if you will. I'd like to review the first DLC from Hearts of Iron 4, Together for Victory. While I don't claim to be the first to review this DLC, I'd like to throw my two cents into the ring, particularly since it's part of the base game now. Before it was integrated, this DLC was somewhat infamous for being ragged on by much of the wider community, who looked unfavorably on its price and what it unlocked, especially as it seemed like Paradox forgot to refresh its content with the release of new patches and expansions. While I won't rebuke or wholly agree with their criticisms, I think the best way to look at this DLC is at two angles, one from then and one from now. And how has this DLC really held up over the past eight years? Well, let's find out. But let's, I mean all of you, I already know why I wrote the script. Together for Victory was the first major DLC for Hoi 4, released six months after the game was, on December 15th, 2016. It was eventually integrated in full into the base game on April 4th, 2024, and is therefore no longer for sale. Then and now, it was referred to as a country pack, the first of its kind. However, since the day it was released, reviews have been generally mixed. Even back in 2016, when the majors in Poland were the only countries with focus trees, people complained that its price didn't reflect the content granted. The timing of of its release was definitely a smart move from a business perspective. It was released both in that early period when interest surrounding the then new Hoi 4 was waning but still high, and during the Christmas season that usually coincides with the general uptick in sales. It was priced at $15 and 15 euros, which is ironically more expensive than the American price. Up until the release of Trial of Allegiance in 2024, this was the only Hoi 4 DLC to be priced at $15 instead of 10 or $20, and it kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, at least for me. It was released alongside the 1.3 update, nicknamed Operation Torch, which was the Anglo-American invasion of Vichy-occupied North Africa in 1942. Among numerous other things, the free update added a number of African releasables, five convoys for Yemen, and Manchukuo as a starting nation. But who cares about that? What does the DLC add? Firstly, the DLC adds a number of minor features, such as the land battle log, which, I'll be honest, I didn't even know that existed, the spearhead battle plan, and the technology sharing feature. Like every DLC, this one added a few new songs to the game, London in Flames, Operation Compass, and Heroes of El Alamein. However, the two main facets of this DLC are the autonomy system and the content for the British Commonwealth. The autonomy system, which arguably should have been a core game feature from the start, allows subjects to break free from their overlords and allows overlords to annex subjects. This system became the benchmark for every future DLC as most of them added new autonomy states. The first autonomy states were the integrated puppet, regular puppet, colony, and dominion in keeping with the commonwealth focus of the DLC. It also added the admittedly amazing feature of releasing a nation as your puppet, which served as an exploit for democratic nations to get puppets. Furthermore, it allowed you to switch over to the nation you were releasing. Honestly, thank god these are all now base game features. As for the commonwealth content mentioned previously, focus trees, portraits, and events were created for five countries, the British Raj and the dominions of Canada, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Sorry, British Malaya. We shall now take a closer look at each of these five countries. Had this video been made a few months ago, I probably would have prefaced this with a spoiler alert, but considering this is all base game content, you could just load this up yourself. The focus trees of the five countries generally follow a similar path, at least politically. You either retain your loyalty and remain a British subject, which is the historical route, or you build up your autonomy and break off from the crown. Where each of the countries vary the most, however, is where you can go after you break away. From west to east, let's begin with... In days of yore, from Britain's shore, all the of the five nations, the Dominion of Canada is the oldest, having gained her independence on July 1st, 1867. Prior to the war effort patches from last year, you had a major decision to make as Canada. Do you get your economy back on track from the Great Depression, or do you mitigate the conscription crisis among the Quebecois? It all depended on which focus tickled your fancy more, National Steel Car or Send in the Zombies. Outside of that, keeping with the crown allows you to do some war stuff nobody cares about and ask for the cession of Newfoundland, which was formerly a separate British dominion, but is now a colony once more. If you decide to split away and remain democratic, you're limited to forming a faction with the United States. If you want to go fascist, you will have to stare at Adrian Arcan's terrifying face, but you can choose between joining the Axis and cooing the Mexican government, allowing the two of you to gangbang the US. The communist path is pretty standard nowadays, but it helped introduce the famous choice that all communist paths must have. 
half. Do you join the common turn or go your own way? However, the war effort patches added in a new communist path where you can go Trotskyist, I guess. Your leader doesn't change, and all you get are a few national spirits. As for South Africa, you have one fewer option for politicking, but the options you do have generally have a bit more to do than Canada. This is the pre-apartheid Unionist South Africa. The government is run by people that hate the British, and while there is segregation, it's not as draconian as the era to come. Don't let that stop the devs from taking away half your manpower pool at the start of the game, though. Anyways, remaining with the crown allows you to kind of anglicize yourself and eventually ask for British colonies in East Africa. You can also establish a bipolar governmental relationship with the black population. Breaking with the crown, though, allows you to worsen or end that relationship. Worsening it would be to go fascist. The fascist leader is Daniel Francois Milan, who, upon winning the 1948 elections, initiated the apartheid era in South Africa. Going fascist will put you firmly in the Axis camp, though you can keep a monarchy somewhat intact, by crowning the former King Edward VIII as King of South Africa. Going communist sees the African population fall behind the banners of revolution, overthrowing the Afrikaner minority and establishing a black-led communist regime. With Moses Kotane at the helm, you can launch a crusade across Africa and liberate the colonies from European control. You can also just straight up demand Madagascar, I guess. British Raj starts off much different than the other four countries. For one thing, it's a colony, not a dominion. For another, it had unremovable nerfs for the longest time. The country is constantly at risk of falling into famine, which did happen in Bengal in 1943. The Raj also has to deal with Muslim separatists in today's Pakistan and Bangladesh, and almost 70% of the population being relegated to the farms. Also, this is the only country where independence is more of an inevitability than a choice. The political branch of the focus tree splits into a a friendly with Britain but also quit India path, and the full-on work with Britain's enemies to gain independence path. Also an inevitability, some kind of civil war. Working with the Soviets or Germans will cause a civil war between you and the British holdouts, and doing things the hard way will likely cause Pakistan to break off and fight you, which will in turn cause Bangladesh to break away and fight Pakistan. Up until the war effort patches, you couldn't get rid of that recruitable population debuff, and India wouldn't even get units for that war against Pakistan. Those have been fixed though, and there are some focuses to manage corruption within the colonial office and to at least somewhat curtail the lack of industrialization. Wagman camped by the billabong under the shade of a kulaba tree. And he sang as, he as for good old Australia, the only issue you have at the start of the game is the effects of the Great Depression. However, you can remove this national spirit through this branch in the focus tree, granted you're at war. Ignoring the blatant inaccuracies of the Australian politics in the game, you have your usual decisions for focus treeing. Remaining a loyal subject will allow you to ask the British to make Malaya your puppet, and this is the only time the devs remembered British Malaya existed when making this DLC, apparently. If you instead decide to give yourself nightmares about the disastrous Gallipoli campaign from World War One. you can remain democratic, ask the Dutch for the East Indies, and create a kind of Pacific NATO. Alternatively, you can go communist or fascist and demand control of New Zealand, twice if you're communist. Fascist Australia gets to demand the most territory of the Five Nations. Alongside the aforementioned New Zealand, it can also fund a rebellion in the Dutch East Indies and demand British holdings in the Pacific. As for the communists, almost their entire path is devoted to helping Mao Zedong in China. You don't even get to decide between Stalin or Dixon until the bottom of the path. Our last country is the one most often forgotten, New Zealand. New Zealand starts with no national spirits and has the smallest focus tree of the five. And, well, there's really nothing to do with New Zealand. I've made an entire video about it already, but you have your standard ideological and loyalist paths, and outside of that, you have the Bob Semple Tank, a partial incorporation of the Maori population, and the Polynesia Formable Nation, which is added three years after the DLC came out. Now that you have the gist of the focus trees, where do my opinions stand on the Together for Victory DLC? 
From every angle, this DLC is a hit or miss. I don't necessarily rank it highly, and I may consider it the worst due to the fact that it's not aged well. However, I don't hate this DLC. There are numerous issues with it, sure. The focus trees are bare bones, it suffers from Paradox's pricing system, and the portraits are subpar and sometimes not even present. However, to judge it solely by today's standards is unfair. Like the historical figures present, we must judge it from the perspective of the audience it was made for in 2016. By 2016 standards, this was an extension of what the base game offered on par with the game's quality at that time. And for a first choice for a DLC, it really did feel like an extra add-on whose absence wouldn't hinder gameplay. Well, minus the autonomy system being DLC only. Think about it. If you were to go back to November 2016 and draw up plans for where to develop next, surely you'd pick a nation with a more pivotal role in World War II, like China, Hong Hungary or maybe Brazil. But for their first DLC, they went with the British Commonwealth, whose members did fight in World War II, but outside of Canada are generally forgotten. I think it was at least a neat decision for the first expansion. As it stands right now, of the five countries, the ranking for the focus trees is as follows. At the bottom of the barrel is New Zealand. It's an extremely boring tree whose only merit is a formable nation that in and of itself amounts to little and is annoying to form anyways. Next rung is the British Raj. Its political tree is its biggest stinker. It's locked behind an unnecessary world tension requirement is somewhat convoluted to follow, and if you go fascist or communist, the only somewhat fun thing the tree lets you do is fight the civil war. After that is Australia. It's also extremely boring in the early game, but it does have a major plus to it. You can break free instantly through a focus instead of having to farm political power and autonomy for over a year and a half. And a more surprising spot is South Africa. South Africa can be genuinely interesting if you set the AI in a certain way. If the British AI decolonizes, then you have plenty of nations to beat up with perhaps little consequence. If not, you could always LARP an anti-colonialist alliance with Ethiopia or maybe Ausa. And the best nation in the DLC, without a doubt, is Canada. Now that you're able to fix both your economy and your manpower crisis, this nation has the potential to become a prosperous and powerful country, perhaps strong enough to take on the United States and Mexico, at least before the U.S. rearms. Its focus tree is also the most modernized, with new content added multiple times, a new admiral added with arms against tyranny, and leader traits for all four potential leaders. If you play your cards right, Canada can be a fun nation to play as, and one you might want to come back to. I wouldn't necessarily argue the DLC was bare bones by 2016 standards, but up until the war effort patches in 2023 and 2024, this DLC saw very little love shown to it, and it quickly fell by the wayside. While every country except for South Africa has seen some kind of minor update from these patches, usually a rebalance of a focus effects, a bug fix, or a new focus, no TFV nation has seen more love than Canada. In the 1.14 release, Canada saw a lot of small new changes. Their leaders all received traits, the Mounties became an intelligence agency, and Quebec was added as a releasable nation. Despite all this, the DLC's contents are still definitely in need of a rework, and there's no better time to do it than now. It would perhaps be a massive crowd pleaser if these updates were released for free, perhaps as version 1.15. In case any Paradox dev or higher up is watching this video, I have some suggestions lined up for each country. My first suggestion is pretty blunt and pretty simple, but also the most far-reaching. Rework all five countries. Add new challenges, beef up the industrial and military focuses, and expand the starting military staff and commander pool. Add some new leaders and make new focus icons too, and give the current leaders unique traits, much like Canada's, or even just traits in general. Also, allow for more late game expansionism. Is it realistic for Canada to naval invade, I don't know, Costa Rica? No. Is it fun? Yeah. However, beyond that, I have some ideas for the individual countries too. I'll list them out in the same order as I introduced them. For Canada, I think we need a couple of alternative democratic paths. Though Mackenzie King and the Liberal Party were the dominant party in Canadian politics for the whole of the game's time frame, they aren't the only party in government. Just a year prior, the Conservative Party held the majority and was ousted in the 1935 elections. I think there should be at least a few focuses in some election events whereby you can put the Conservatives back in power, which would make RB Bennett, Robert Mannion, and or John Bracken, the country leader. Conversely, an independent monarchist path would be really cool. Perhaps the Canadian people want to keep a monarch after patriation is complete. Or maybe it's just because I like that one useful charts video. You could maybe try and set up a Canadian colonial empire too. That would be both fun and somewhat funny. As for South Africa, my first suggestion is an ultimately minor one, but I can't take credit for it. This one was originally suggested by the wonderful YouTuber known as Hovelax way back in 2018. He suggested 
suggested that when the A King for Our People focus is completed, there should be an option to make Edward VIII the country leader as opposed to a national spirit. Extra leader choice is always appreciated. Next, I want to see improvements to the idea of the crusade against colonialism. While I'm not suggesting modeling it off of Ethiopia's focus tree, I do think seeing South Africa back some major rebellions as opposed to just conquering these colonies would be a much more realistic and better exercise of the communists' foreign policy. Lastly, and this somewhat ties in with the previous one, but I feel like there should be an independent democratic path of some kind. Not just a standard Republican path, though. I mean a full-on black-led republic. There were a number of African politicians in charge of the ANC that would be fitting candidates to institute majority rule. Maybe you could then create some kind of anti-colonialist alliance with Liberia or nations like Siam and Afghanistan. When it comes to the British Raj, there's a lot that needs to be fixed. From Lord Linlithgow not actually being the viceroy at the game start, to Bangladesh fighting the war with independence without 30 years of Karachi's abuses as justification, the whole colony can be summed up as erroneous. But sticking to larger suggestions here, the Raj seriously needs at least a few expansionist focuses, particularly with the communist and fascist paths. Now, these should be something you're able to do from the get-go, but going after areas like Nepal, Bhutan, or Ceylon could be fun for those looking to stay out of the broader global conflict, but still want to beat up some neighboring nations. Furthermore, there should be more releasable countries. Kashmir, Sikkim, Hyderabad, and Kalat were all nations that briefly gained their independence after the partition of India. And the existence of these nations could not only help alter the Indo-Pakistani borders, but tie into my next suggestion. A way to federate an independent India. Rather than just losing Burma and Pakistan every time, what if Gandhi's dream of a united subcontinent came to fruition by means of federating away regions like Kashmir, Punjab, Bengal, or Hyderabad? For Australia, my first gripe is the starting political situation. John Curtin was not the Prime Minister in 1936 or 1939. In fact, the Labour Party didn't take over until successful motion of no confidence in 1941. In both start dates, the coalition of the United and Country Parties was in control of the Australian government. 1936, the Prime Minister was Joseph Lyons. 1939, it was Robert Menzies, as Lyons had died of a heart attack back in April. However, making these changes would open the door to a special focus tree path for the Labour Party, as elections were held in 1937 and 1940. What could also be addressed is the split in the Labour Party from earlier in the decade. Does the name Jack Lang ring a bell? Hell, the devs apparently forgot that John Curtin himself died in office in 1945. Aside from that, my only other suggestion for Australia also applies to New Zealand, and again, it's one Hovelax came up with. A formable nation for Australasia, between Australia and New Zealand, perhaps with extra cores on Dutch New Guinea, New Caledonia, and Vanuatu. Lastly, for New Zealand, it's tricky to make this nation fun, and I had trouble coming up with good suggestions, but I managed to cook up a couple. Firstly, and this is old news by now, but there should be a special path for if the National Party comes to power in the 1938 elections. Hell, they have Sidney Holland as a country leader, though George Forbes or Adam Hamilton would be a more realistic choice for Hoy Ford's time frame. Side note, Hamilton's portrait is sourced from 1953. I know Paradox can be hard pressed to find that sweet spot with portrait sources, but Wikipedia has an, albeit small, portrait of him from 1935, and I'm sure there are other more time accurate sources out there, but that's beside the point. My last suggestion for New Zealand is a little zany, but perhaps you could allow New Zealand to create a reputation for themselves as a modern revival of the Hyksos, the sea people said to have conquered ancient Egypt at one point in time. Maybe by creating a powerful navy or by gaining war goals for territory on the other side of the Pacific, they could become a nation whose name drives fear into the hearts of Californians, Colombians, and Cambodians alike. In conclusion, the Together for Victory DLC absolutely deserves its title of it was pretty on par with the rest of the game when it was first released, but nowadays it's in serious need of a rework. Its integration into the base game is a welcome change in my books, and if Paradox does rework these five countries and doesn't do so with a paywall on the way, it could bring these previously belittled nations much higher in the rankings of fun Hoi 4 miners. We can always hope, right? Well, I'd like to know where you all stand with regard to this DLC. Let me know in the comments below. Remember to do the usual bullshit of liking the video and hitting that subscribe button and the whole nine yards. And of course, drink your water and stop falling over.